Right. Okay, so thank you very you much. Um, yeah, it's my third time, I think, here at this uh, conference in Castiglione no, 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 Lucello. No, 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 no. uh, each time talking about very different subjects, and from my understanding, this is the perfect place to tell you about some unorthodox ideas and uh, kind of unorthodox physics. So the, the plan is, is here, but let's immediately jump into motivations. So you know that physicists, we like to develop models of uh, reality, and uh, these models have to be faithful, which means the obvious thing, maybe that they have to be to, to make correct uh, empirical predictions, but this is not sufficient for a model to be uh, relevant to physics. They should also allow us to tell stories about how nature does it. How nature does it is maybe the kind of basic questions we, we like to address. Uh, and and a model should not be just uh, correct empirically, uh, but also allow to tell stories. And there's another motivation, which is a bit disconnected, but you see that I make connections between them. My second motivation is to bring classical closer to quantum. You know, since uh, a century or more, we are trying the opposite. Usually, we try to bring quantum closer to classical, uh, maybe classical variables and things like that. So here, I'm going the opposite way. I make classical closer to quantum, and the goal here is really to see which features are really truly quantum, and which features of quantum are actually already present in classical physics. So here is just a. Uh, a slide illustrating stars. You all recognize, of course, universal gravitation. I uh, see that because we are not using my computer, this is not moving, but you can easily guess that the blue bubbles should be moving around like in a one in motion. And so we know that things don't fall from top to the bottom, but we know that things tend to fall towards the center of Earth. You don't need an equation to tell these kind of stories. And then you have uh, stories about the tides, of course the moon orbiting Earth, and brown in motion with this blue particle hitting the red particle, and the blue particle having some mean kinetic energy, which we name temperature. Um, another way also to motivate all that is this huge tension between relativity on one side, uh, with the block universe view, and quantum randomness on the other side. And Einstein himself saying that uh, you know this distinction between past, present, and future is nothing but a stubbornly persistent illusion. While in quantum mechanics we have the view that uh, randomness is not an illusion, it's the fact, it's the essence. And indeed, let me just remind ourselves that you can easily really derive <coughs> indeterminacy or quantum indeterminacy randomness. If you have two distant parties, traditionally named Alice and Bob, and we make some assumptions, the first is no instantaneous communication at a distance. Okay, technically, people you often call that uh, no signaling. And the second one, that there is no conspiracy, which means they exist independent variables. So, in particular, these inputs here on Alice and on Bob's side are independent of whatever kind of source you have here in the middle. And then if you violate some very equality, then you have a theorem, so it's not an opinion, it's a theorem, that tells you that the outcomes here are truly random. And this must be true because it has been published in Nature. <laughs> <laughs> it's long ago, long enough ago that people had time to check the, the theorem. And the theorem is not only qualitatively, but even quantitatively, you know exactly how much randomness you get out given the, the amount of violation of CHSH, and depending whether you have only the assumptions with that I showed you, which would lead to this amount of randomness, if you make the extra assumption that quantum mechanics is a good description, you get even more randomness out. Okay, and once you have that, you can put it in a little box, and commercialize it with ID Antique, our startup company, and then you give it to engineers and they make it very, very small and uh, low power consumption, and then you can have it into smartphones. Samsung smartphones, unfortunately for the time being, only available in Korea, with Korean uh, 
uh, written application, so it's not very useful to, I guess there's no Korean person here, so it's not useful to us yet. Nevertheless, I think this is the first mass application of quantum information science. And for me, what is interesting is the conceptual consequence, maybe, that quantum technology will bring into people's mind the idea of scientific indeterminism. Okay. So let me maybe start from the conclusion somehow, but just summarizing the main messages. So the first one is the following. Whether Newtonian classical mechanics is deterministic or not, is not a scientific question. It depends on the physical significance one associates with mathematical real numbers. Of course, I'm going to develop and spend most of the, uh, uh, my time on that. And the second one, which is kind of obvious, the mathematical language we use when speaking physics has a huge influence on the worldview that physics presents to us. We all speak more than one language here, I guess, and so we all know very well that some ideas and some concepts are easier to formulate in one language than in another one. But this is also true if you use mathematics. Although we have been selected and passed our exams by our ability to swallow classical mathematics, the Platonian view, this is not the only mathematical language that exists. And if you speak another type of mathematical languages, then there are things you can do, or easier, do, do easier, easier um, than if you stick to <coughs> classical mathematics. Again, I will develop that. And hence, uh, we face a choice. Either our stories present events as the consequence of long past initial conditions, that's the standard view, or else we understand the present as the result of indeterminate reality and the future is open. And the last one, not the least one, much of quantum is actually also classical if one can consider classical as indeterministic. Okay, so let me start now with this intuitionistic mathematics, but maybe tell you why I'm a physicist, kind of an engineer, whatever, uh, so why should I be the right person to talk about intuitionistic mathematics? Well, I think we can all do that because we all do physics, and for that we need uh, appropriate mathematical tools and concepts. But then comes the question, which mathematics? Uh, clearly, I already said. So Brouwer, uh, the father of intuitionism, so he was a, a Dutch mathematician about 100 years ago, introduced into his mathematics the concept of an ideal mathematician. And this ideal mathematician, <coughs> namely the creating subject, continually produces new information by solving mathematical conjectures. So that really doesn't sound very physical. Uh, it's not the mathematicians that should produce new information. We have quantum random number generator, and maybe if we believe in indeterminism, it's nature that produces new information as time passes. So the way I'm going to present intuitionism, so intuitionistic mathematics, will be without an ideal mathematician, and it will really be motivated by the physical concept of indeterminism. So most likely, Brouwer would not have liked my presentation, but Brouwer was kind of almost a solipsist, as a very ideal, idealistic um, uh, philosopher, or mathematician, but with this kind of philosophical uh, inclination. So I'm a physicist, and I will stay, stick to naive realism. And so my main claim is really that intuitionistic mathematics is the natural mathematical tool to describe indeterminism in physics, a bit like derivative is a natural tool to describe velocities. So let's start. That's the first encounter for probably most of you to intuitionistic mathematics. So numbers, we start with numbers. One, two, three, four. And the uh, numbers are clearly there to compute. But then, how can it be that most of the so called real numbers are actually not computable? Let's start with something very simple, just bits, 0 and 1. And let's define the bit n1, n1 equals 0, if every integer between 4 and 10 to the 4 is the sum of two primes. Else n1 equals 1. So most 
likely most of you don't know the value of N1, but obviously every one of us could jump on a computer in a matter of a few, okay, it depends now on the people, minutes or hours, solve that problem and find out that N1 has the value uh, zero. Then you can define N2 similarly, but now between four and 10 to a huge number. Okay, then, even if you have a very good computer, probably even if you have a quantum computer, you're not going to find out the value of N1. Nevertheless, we all know of an algorithm that will give us the value of N1 in a finite time. A huge time, we're not talking about efficiency here, but it's a finite time. So, even if we don't know the value of N2, we probably all agree that N2 has a value. But now let's go to the following, N3, and here the condition is just an even integer larger than 4, without any upper bound. And this actually is a, a well-known uh, conjecture in uh, number theory. And so here no one knows the value of N3. Moreover, no one knows an algorithm that is going to give us an answer in a finite time, in a fixed given finite time. We cannot bound that. Okay, so what is the value of N3? <coughs> well, every student probably knows that in order not to fail an exam, because we have been selected to have to give this answer, so the student, and probably all of us, would claim that N3 has a determined value. 3 seems to be just a definition. Why is it called conjecture? Oh, because we don't know. We don't know whether every even integer larger than 4 is, a, is the sum of two primes. We don't know. We just don't know whether n3 is n3 equals 0. Hmm? The conjecture is n3 equals 0. The conjecture is n3 equals 0. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Yes, yes. n3 equals 0 is the conjecture. OK, so now the question, does n3 have a value? And we would all probably say, yes, it has a determined value, either 0 or 1. And this is where in the, uh, intuitionism enters. So if the exam is in intuitionistic mathematics, then the student should answer that the value of N3 is indeterminate. It really has no value today. And moreover, so it implies that the law of the excluded middle is not valid because it could be 0, n3 equals 0, n3 equals 1, or n3 indeterminate. And there's even something more shocking, maybe here, to the class shocking to the classical mathematician, namely that the value of n3 may evolve over time. Maybe in 10 years someone will prove or disprove con uh, col uh, Goldbach's uh, conjecture, and then the value of n3 may evolve from indeterminate to determinate. So this is very surprising to all classical mathematicians and certainly to most, if not all of you. But so the idea from this intuitionistic standpoint is that, as Carl Posse wrote, that we humans have finite memories, finite attention spans, and finite lives. So we can fully grasp only finitely many finite sized pieces of a compound thing. There is no infinite helicopter allowing us to survey the whole terror and tell how things will look at the end of time. You know, if we have a, a road with a lot of forks, if you have a good helicopter, you can see ahead what is coming. Okay, you can do it with Google Maps also. But uh, for the, in time, such a helicopter does not exist. Or also, Norway, uh, Eric Bishop also famous constructivist, wrote, the classical, so classic, uh, classicist, the mathematician, wishes to describe God's mathematics. The constructivist, to describe the mathematics of finite beings, man's mathematics for short. Constructive mathematics does not postulate a pre-existing universe with objects lying around waiting to be collected and grouped into sets like shells on a beach. So things really happen as time passes. We are not predetermined or pre-existing as uh, Bishop wrote here. And Rohr himself wrote, you know, nature simply has not yet fully determined all objects. A bit like the uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics that we are more familiar with. 
So that's the essence of intuitionism. But maybe some of you now start to get worried, what is this very strange mathematics? Uh, maybe one important thing is really to state that with intuitionistic mathematics you can compute and prove theorems. It's not always the same, we shall see some examples, as in classical mathematics, and it's maybe not the same proof. But everything one can do on a classical computer can be done with an intuitionistic mathematics. So we can certainly do physics with intuitionistic mathematics. Okay, again, this should be moving, but not my computer here. But you can understand, so this is a chaotic system, and we usually talk about deterministic chaos. But is it really deterministic? Or is it a consequence of using the language of classical mathematics, so assuming this God's eye point of view, or the view from the end of time? And so Yuval Dolev wrote, tense and passage are not, never were, and probably cannot be part of physics and its language. So let's take a much simpler chaotic dynamical system. It's essentially the Baker's map. So now the state space is just a number between 0 and 1, probability, and let's say the probability of rain. And so the transformation on one time step is you stretch it and you fold it back. So this is uh, the equation corresponding, but if you write this equation in binary format, so because x lies between 0 and 1, it starts with 0 or dot, and then you have a string of bits. And this time, time step, which I just uh, presented, is a very simple one. The second bit becomes the first one, so the first one drops out, the second one becomes the first, the third one becomes the second, and so on. So you shift everything by one step to the, to the left. And then the question whether x lies on the left half, so it's mostly sunny on the right half, mostly rainy, after n time steps, depends on the nth bit of the initial condition. And the question now is that the billionth bit physically real? According to classical mathematics, of course it is real. But is it physically real? And the question is not whether this billionth bit can be measured. Obviously it cannot be measured, but whether it corresponds to some, something physical. So let's look more about typical real numbers. So here is a typical real number, or more precisely my intuition of a... Oh, sorry. Coming later. So, typical real numbers. So, most of the typical real numbers, if I ask you to name some, you're going to name one of these numbers. Uh, and so, very important is to uh, realize that the bits of typical real numbers have no structure. So, they are as random as random as, uh, as quantum measurement outcomes. So, this is probably a good way of thinking of a typical real number. You know, what comes out of a random number generator, quantum number. And actually, uh, since there are only countably many names and algorithms, typical real numbers contain an infinite amount of information. And indeed, uh, Emil uh, Borel was saying that, uh, noticing that in one real number, just one real number, one can call the answers to all questions one can formulate in any human language. And so, uh, Gregory Chatin, the famous uh, uh, theorist of uh, complexity, was that actually this way of thinking of a typical real number is not only one possibility, but it's the only good way of thinking of a typical real number. So when we say, for instance, that x0 be the initial condition described by a real number, what we are effectively saying is that x0 denote an infinite amount of information. So it's not at all harmless to say that x0 be the initial condition. And one way of um, motivating what I want now to say is uh, maybe not necessary, but it's, I think, a very natural assumption, is that in a finite volume, you can have only finite information. So in this little uh, tube here, you can have only finite information. So if I put a, a marble here in, the center of mass of this marble uh, cannot be a real number because a typical real number would have infinite information. Okay, and now come to this typical real number, so my intuition of it. So here is a typical real number, and I checked and made sure that the, num the digits here are really random. <laughs> um, so it starts with a zero, but any integer, and then you have these digits coming one after the other, 
And okay, I'm not going to spend all day with that, but... Did you use your Korean cell phone to generate it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Um, so how about that? And so if you wait long enough, of course the screen will be full. And once the screen is full, it just continues. Now it goes down. It's going to cross all Earth. It was going out of the solar system and so on. And it just goes on forever. Okay, that's not exactly what a mathematician would tell, uh, consider to be a real number. A mathematician would probably say. Uh, let's just say okay, that's now the classical mathematics mathematician for a real number. So for, for, for mathematics, and this is what we're doing without always being really aware of it. It goes like that. Just watch the screen now. In zero time, infinite information. Zero time, infinite information. This is the mathematics we have been trained to swallow. Physical nonsense. Zero time, infinite information. So here, instead of indeterministic events happening as time passes, all the indeterminism is coded in the initial condition. Of course, you can always assume that everything goes back to the initial condition, and the initial condition contains the future. So instead of God playing dice, as time passes, God plays all the dice at the Big Bang and coded all the outcomes in the initial condition. So here again we see that it's really the mathematical language that forces us to speak of deterministic chaos. So mathematical real numbers are not physically real. Or in short, I like to say real numbers are not really real. Maybe if you remember only these words, real numbers are not really real. So, and right, let's go to applied physics. So how do people really do that? So today, for instance, one very important uh, topic is climate physics. And these people do uh, use uh, huge computers and uh, predict uh, the climate in uh, tens or even centuries, tens of years or centuries. And uh, so what they do is the following. Because you know, even if a computer is huge, they cannot put a real number in it. That's infinite. So they truncate it. So we use truncated numbers. Also, anyway, they don't measure real numbers. So they put whatever they can be put in, and then they let the simulation go on. But because this is a chaotic system, quite quickly, they need additional digits. How do they do? They just add stochastic remainders. So actually, the way these people do uh, simulate the climate is using my intuition about real numbers, where the digits come you know, one after the other. So that is the first uh, co consequence. So whether Newton, Newton in classical mechanics is deterministic or not is not a scientific question. It depends on the physical significance one associates with uh, two real uh, numbers. So we all know about these kind of discussions between Einstein and uh, Bohr, and Einstein and uh, Bergson. Uh, okay, you know all that. But there was another discussion about at the same time between these two mathematicians, so David Hilbert and uh, Brouwer. So the, the Hilbert, I take as the typical example for classical mathematics, where every real number is an individual completed entity. All digits are given at once. And the continuum is a collection of individual points, you know, like the shell on the beach. And real numbers exist outside of time in some ideal platonistic world. On the other side, Brouwer, the father of intuitionistic mathematics, considered real numbers as processes that develop in time. Digits are not all given at once. And the continuum is a viscous collection of processes. I will define viscous in a few minutes. And so here, time is essential to intuitionism. At any instance, only finite information exists. So now let me start to define, or to introduce really intuitionistic mathematics a bit more formally. So uh, Brouwer introduced the terminology of choice sequences. So I have a discrete time indexed by this integer n, 
and alpha of n is the available information at that time n. And okay, according to Brouwer, that these choices to go from one time to the next one would be made by this idealized mathematician. But I'm going to assume, and I think from a physical point of view, it makes a lot of sense, that nature has the power to produce true randomness, so to produce new information. That is, if you want to describe indeterminism, that's a very natural step. So I have my natural random process that produces, and let's say here, bits for simplicity, and out of these bits, I compute my, my sequence of, uh, of choice sequences. So at each time, a natural random number process outputs some random number, and then alpha of n is a computable function of the previous value of this choice sequence, maybe the time, and the existing information, so the random bits up to time n. And the function okay, is computable, and uh, there is some convergence <coughs> assumption here. So that's classically one would converge to a, what we call a real number. So the first example is the obvious one. You just take the next, the last bit here, and you add it at the end of your uh, uh, series of, of bits here. You could do it with each, of course. Second example is a computable number. So for a computable number, the function is not going to depend on all the randomness, but you have only a, let's say, a finite initial sequence, which we usually call the seed. You know, the seed of pseudo-random numbers, or it could also be uh, a seed that defines, for instance, uh, this typical computable number, pi. So here is an example of such a formula. Uh, so, so an algorithm, so this has only finite information here. I wrote it on the, on the board, so you see it's finite information. Um, and what is really amazing with this uh, example is that all of the bits may look random, they are really hidden in the algorithm. This algorithm allows one to compute the nth hexadecimal, hence also the nth bit uh, of pi, without computing the previous one. So you can really compute, let's say, the one millionth bit of pi without the need of computing first the first ones. So you can jump ahead, which is, I think, a very good illustration that, at least for pi, all these bits already exist. We don't come one after the other. OK, here is another example of uh, an intuitionistic number. So here we do about the same. Uh, but we take some majority votes. You know, so you introduce some correlations. Uh, okay. Now here is an interesting number. Again, interesting. So you have alpha n is fluctuating around one half, and whether it is larger or smaller than one half depends on, on the value of the nth uh, random bit, and it's getting closer and closer to uh, to one half. And this goes on. This fluctuation goes on until, by chance, the last, let's say, half of the random bits uh, all have the, same, have the same value, maybe all zero or all one. And then it stops, and it stops wherever it was. And because the probability of termination of uh, decreases, of dying, that's why I call it a mortal number, decreases exponentially, there is an a priori probability that the sequence goes on forever. So, you know, it's fluctuating. Possibly at some point it will stop above one half or it will stop just below one half, or possibly it goes on forever. There is also a probability it goes on forever. So, here you see that a uh, question like is alpha smaller than one half or not is indeterminate because you cannot know whether it will stop just above, just below, or actually continue fluctuating forever. <laughs> Here is another example, it's my last example, we call it autonomous number, because here in the function uh, the value of n doesn't appear. Okay, and here you see that you have two fixed points, if alpha n equals 0, but it, it will no longer change, or if alpha n equals 1, it will no longer change, you have fixed points, so it converges to 0 or 1 with some probabilities given here, and for those like uh, our children <coughs> who know about uh, stochastic Schrodinger equation, this is exactly the same process as the one that we are using in stochastic Schrodinger equations, whether it is the GRW model, I 
should have mentioned, of course, our chairman's model or my old quantum state diffusion model. So here we have more than two fixed points. We have uh, okay, it's photon number, so I guess uh, every every integer is a fixed number. But the same process that we had uh, have in this autonomous number. You can you also have logic. So of course the statement R n equals zero is indeterminate before the nth time step. That's the meaning of this being really random. You cannot predict it. It's not even fixed, it's not a matter of not being able to predict it, even nature doesn't know the value of Rn. This proposition is indeterminate, and this I put in parallel to the physical proposition, it will rain in exactly one year from now at Piccadilly Circus. We have been trained to say, oh yes, we, I don't know whether it's going to rain or not, but for sure this is determined. But that's because you already swallow determinants and swallow classical mathematics with infinite information. Actually, it was all set at the Big Bang. But you can also well say, it just indeterminate. Even nature didn't decide whether it's going to rain in a year time at Piccadilly Circus. And so the law of the excluded middle is not valid. And that means that no non-constructive uh, existence proof and at least the mathematicians, they love to do non-constructive existence proof, but in physics we never need them. What is the point of proving the existence of something that we cannot even make or construct? It's not physical. Okay, so this is surprising, but makes a lot of sense in an indeterministic world. <coughs> yeah. So the elements of the continuum an uh, evolving sequence of computable numbers. Okay, I've already said that, so since I have to do a bit first. So here you have one consequence of uh, in the, uh, intuitionistic mathematics, namely something called the Brouwer's theorem. All total functions, so functions defined everywhere, are continuous. So you don't have step functions. The reason is that you could not have a step at one half because of this number the alpha that is fluctuating around one half. So you don't know whether this one should go just a little bit to the right or to the left of that step. So you cannot have a, a discontinuous function here. Uh, so this is something new compared to classical mathematics. Uh, but again, we are used to step functions, but of course step functions can be approximate as well as you want with a continuous function. Um, and this is really the meaning of this viscosity of the continuum, because you, you cannot pick out a number like you cannot pick out a, a, a honey molecule out of a honey pot. It, it's viscous, it's sticky. Okay, let's just go a bit fast here. Uh, of course you can do additions, you can use uh, computable functions of a choice sequence. Uh, okay, you can define, a, okay, it's only a partial order here, things like that. Let me go a bit fast here. Uh, but clearly, so, this mathematical language has a huge influence, and I like this table which puts next to uh, indeterministic physics, intuitionistic mathematics. <coughs> so in indeterministic physics, past, present, and future are not all given at once, like digits of real numbers are not all given at once. Time passes in physics, numbers are processes. In determinism, numbers contain finite information. The present is thick, something which I didn't define, but which is quite intuitive. Uh, the conti uh, continuum is viscous, the future is open, no law of the excluded middle, becoming choice sequences, experiencing intuitionism. Ah, so just one, uh, so some physicists, and Sabine Ossenfelder is probably an extreme example, would say that if you deny uh, determinism, you are even denying scientific evidence. So very clearly, we deeply disagree, Sabine and myself. <laughs> okay, once uh, you have that, so you have indeterministic physics, whether it is quantum or classical, you have essentially two choices. Either you look for additional variable, so that the randomness is purely epistemic, or you accept rest potential in addition to rest extension in your basic ontology. So let's start with uh, supplementary variables. As I already said, instead of God playing dice, 
when potentiality is become uh, actual, God pays all the dice at the initial <coughs> condition. At the initial <coughs> so postulating that the initial condition of all classical dynamical systems are faithfully described by mathematical real numbers is an elegant way of adding all future results while making sure that they remain inaccessible for long enough a time. So actually what we are doing when we use standard classical real numbers is using hidden, really hidden, inaccessible variables. So the real numbers, the classical real numbers, are the hidden variables of classical mechanics. So we already see that this idea of looking for hidden variables, which is usually attributed to quantum, actually we use it all the time in classical, mecha uh, classical mechanics. So we face a choice, I already said that, and the fact is that almost all physicists accept real numbers, again we have been selected to do that, without noticing that they are hidden variables, while the same physicists usually reject Bohmian positions, which would be the equivalent of in quantum mechanics, and they say Bohmian positions are not necessary. Of course, Bohmian positions also contain infinite information. Okay, let me go to what I find more interesting, namely the second option, uh, adding rest potential to rest ex extension. So uh, here I want to tell you how to go from indeterminacy to indeterminacy. So a causal chain that would start from nowhere a form of indeterminism, but well, that's kind of magical. You cannot have something that just pops up out of nothing. But on the other side, seeing that the physical system uh, whose state is not yet fully determined, this I claim is physical. After all, our world is full of indeterminism. So it's really like these real numbers. They're not yet completed. So maybe the position of any Particle, classical particle should not be considered as yet fully determined. Maybe there is some indeterminacy here. And as time passes, new information reduces this indeterminacy, and this then leads to indeterminism. So we can reuse it such that it goes to the left or that it goes to the right. And so this indeterminism, as I like to present it, does not come out of the blue, it is not a causal simply some potentialities get excluded. Okay, now bring classical closer to quantum. So now we see that both quantum and classical can be seen as indeterministic. For classical it's an option, because of course you can just use these hidden variables, the standard real numbers, and then you make it deterministic. Quantum, by the way, you can also, but I would say then you would violate this idea of uh, no signaling. Bone mechanics hides and no signal in, in, a, in a clever way. But that means then that you have a measurement problem, very well known in quantum, but I'm claiming that this measurement problem is not specific to quantum. <coughs> the reduction of indeterminacy has to be now coming either right, spontaneously or triggered by a higher order demand, like Copenhagen, who say it's, it's a classical measurement apparatus that triggers that, or hidden variables. Also, the many-world view, which is relatively famous in quantum mechanics, well, you could equally well apply it to classical mechanics. Many-world is not specifically quantum. It's specific to indeterminism. You can always, if you have indeterminism, claim that everything happens just in parallel universes. Um, but there is one thing, I know, one more thing that they have in common. Both classic and quantum are known for some form of non-locality, because measuring here can have uh, reduced uh, indeterminacy there. So for instance, if you have now a classical, think of it as a classical particle that has some indeterminacy, so center of mass described with some indeterminacy, an intuitionistic number, and here you have something that splits it, let's say, into two parts, then you could have that additional information localizes the system on one side. And so this is a form of non-locality. Here we don't violate the inequality clearly, but there is a form of non-locality that is very uh, uh, common <coughs> to quantum physicists. 
Or you could also now have our famous Alice and Bob, and let's suppose that Alice's particle has this indeterminacy, Bob the similar one, but the relation between the two is much better determined. <laughs> so everyone who is familiar with entanglement we recognize that this smells like entanglement, but it's not entanglement, this is classical uh, mechanics with intuitionist mathematics. And now as time passes, let's suppose here we do some weak measurements, so we reduce the indeterminacy, but because of the correlation between the high correlation between the two sides, this one gets also reduced. And we can give, go even further, and here now do a, a strong, let's say, position measurement. So this one gets now determined. This one will not get fully determined, but it, it's limited by the amount of indeterminacy in the relation between the two particles, between Alice and Bob. So we have also some form of non-locality, and non-locality is not specifically quantum. So what is really quantum? And I think the only quantum, only quantum has the incompatible, has incompatible physical quantities. P and Q, as you all know. It's only there that Planck's constants actually appears. And it's only here, thanks to that, to this existence of incompatible physical quantities, that quantum can violate a bell inequality. So I'm not claiming that classically you can violate the bell inequality. For that you need H bar and you need the, and the, the you know uh, uncertainty, Heisenberg uncertain or indeterminacy relations. Okay, and here I'm almost on time. So thank you very much. I'll let you read uh, the conclusion. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Director Hans Thomas, can we do a special exceptional favor to, to add five minutes a our discussion? Yeah? Who was first? Please. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I missed the first uh, minute, so apologies for this. Uh, um, a very quick uh, question. Uh, so, um, maybe a naive question, let's say. Um, how do you um, select instance? So, what is the unit measure, so to speak, uh, of the intuitionistic? Uh, mathematics. Yes. Good question. So, so indeed, I discretized uh, time and I even talked about instances, which sound again inst instantaneous, so like a real number. So, indeed, uh, this is a good question. I, I'm not sure I have a good answer to it. Uh, it should be more a kind of more continuous process, but again, continuous in which sense, the classical or the intuitionistic one. So, this is the best I can do at present. But I agree with you that this is still uh, still deserves uh, further thoughts. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So my question is more about the definitions. You said that you refuse the uh, claim that if uh, I forgot the name of the scientist who made it, that if you deny determinism, you are denying evidence. Something. Yeah. So, yeah, so in my understanding, um, so there's no clear definition of the word determinism because in my understanding, determinism and predictability are two different things and determinism is more about the past than it is about the future but I believe you're using the word determinism as equivalent to predictability because I think in her code she was using determinism as simply the existence of a causal chain which can be traced to the past. So first of all, Sabi very clearly doesn't confuse. By determinism, she doesn't mean a predictability, because we all know that physics cannot predict even the weather of tomorrow, even less, of course, the weather in a year time or a century. No, no, we are really talking at the ontological level, both Sabi and myself, but she claims that not only the past is fixed, but the future is equally fixed as the past. It's exactly the same. Like in the block, uni the block uh, universe view of quantum mechanics. And actually, um, oh no, it's not yet. 
Ah, no, here. No. Okay, there's one paper which I also wrote with my collaborator, Fabio Del Santo, which is not yet on that one, which is about the open path. So I think with intuitionistic or finite information physics, it would be very natural not only to assume that the future is open, but also that the very remote past, not, not yesterday, but the very remote past is also open. That also information gets uh, really erased, evaporates. Not from our souvenir or anything like that, but it really disappears. <coughs> this is another story which I did not mention here. But so for here, when I said determinism, it's not about predictability. It's determinism on the ontological. I agree with you that uh, classical physics should uh, not be formulated in a deterministic way. Um, now concerning intuitic uh, mathematics, uh, it's certainly a possibility, but I'm not yet really convinced uh, that it is needed and uh, useful. Let me explain. If you start formulating your classical physics in terms of probabilities, which is certainly uh, an option, uh, you, instead of having Newton as an axiom, you take Liouville's equations for particles, uh, then of course you have indeterminism from the beginning. And you have of course also this question of probability uh, you know, for uh, yes and no, uh, with certain probabilities. Now, a probability distribution uses of course real numbers. And now you would say, uh, that's uh, where uh, indeterminism comes in, or intuitive mathematics comes in. But I would say, does it really matter if we describe a probability distribution by an infinite number of bits, or we use only a high number and finite number of bits? I mean, it seems so much simpler to use just the classical concepts of probabilities. Okay. Uh, I think we agree on, on a lot, and I think I never said that intuitionistic uh, mathematics is necessary. I just said if you change the language, and this is certainly an option, not a necessity, but an option, then um, describing classical, me mechani uh, classical mechanics as indeterministic follows in a very natural way. Uh, and also, again, you could do it in different ways, and if you do it with probabilities, you could use a, a standard a real number, that's fine. I'm not sure you need it. Um, what, what I really like in this intuitionistic mathematics, which is something I discovered only recently, I mean, I didn't discover intuitionistic mathematics, but I discovered its existence in the literature, uh, is not only that it has this idea of finite information, finite information density, but also that time plays this essential role. And it's very surprising that time can enter not only physics, which I know in my bones since ever, although classical uh, mechanics claims the opposite, uh, but time can even enter mathematics. And this is very surprising. Mathematics, for me, until a few years ago, was really living in this platonistic world that has no time. <coughs> Things exist in server forever. And here it's not the case. You have a form of mathematics that really brings in time in a very essential way. And I find that very attractive. But not necessary. I'm not claiming it's, it's a necessity. Okay, two more questions, please. So let's consider the following generalization of Schrodinger evolution. It is still deterministic and non-preserving, but the Hamiltonian is not self-adjoint, so the evolution is non-unitary, but the system is closed. Now I say let us observe it at coarse-grained time intervals. I expect the emergent evolution to then be indeterministic in the sense of measurement. And it seems to me this is an essential difference between quantum and classical evolution. Classical evolution is unitary. The Hamiltonian is always self-adjoint for a closed system, but uh, not uh, necessarily in this broader picture of quantum theory. And I'm not sure this has something to do with intuitionism, but I may, I may be wrong, so I would like to know. Right, okay, I'm not exactly sure how I should reply. Uh, for sure, you, you can present classical mechanics 
the way I tried with this intuitionistic uh, mathematics in such a way that you have also this indeterminacy yeah. and you can reduce the indeterminacy, this reduction yeah. may yeah. also now trigger, you know, it goes one way or the other way, so this branching. And you could then say all branches happen like in the many world and have a more realistic view that only one happens. Um, and you're saying there are different ways also of presenting quantum mechanics, and I certainly agree on that. Uh, and maybe some ways of presenting classical and quantum mechanics show a lot of similarities, and that's my aim, show how much they have in common. Because we are very surprised by quantum, but actually if we really think a bit harder on classical, we should be very surprised by classical mechanics also. But I'm not saying now that, you know, I'm also saying, and at the end I said, like, hey, there are some things that are different. And H-bar, essentially, that's the difference. You have these, uh, these commuting operators, or the non-commuting, sorry, non-commuting operators, which lead to the indeterminacy relations, P and Q, or spin components, and so on. So you have these differences. I was saying there's one more difference, non-unitarity. Well, I mean, these, these additional digits that come in, of course, they don't affect the Hamiltonian equation or the symplectic structure, if you call a unitary for classical. Um, but simply adding this new information as time passes is not part of unitarity. It's something that comes in addition to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. Yes, yes. Sorry, you saw a number that was very, very long. Many, many one, N1, N2, N3? I don't know. I don't know. It's very, very, very long uh, digits. digits. Okay, okay. Then. Well, the digits came one after the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it may go outside the solar system. Uh, what, what, what is the point? I mean, it could be a rational number, or it could Of course, it could be. So every computable number, and obviously every rational number is computable. So all the computable numbers, they have finite information. So you can compress everything into an algorithm. Uh, which is going to stick maybe not on one slide, but on a finite number of slides. Mm -hmm. So it's not going out of the solar system. Uh, at least not forever. Um, but these are the exceptional numbers. A typical real number has no algorithm to produce it, or produce its digits. So a typical real number contains this unlimited, so infinite amount of information. Although you're right, the numbers that we use, and every number that we put into a computer, will be a computable number. But these are the exceptions. They are the exceptions, although it's the only ones we can name. You cannot name a number which has infinite information, because the name would itself need to be infinitely long. So you cannot <laughs> articulate it. Okay. So every number that we ever meet in our life are exceptional. Okay. Yeah, my uh, big phone. Uh, the director has a question. You want? I want to ask a question. Mm -hmm. I have several questions, but I will ask only one. To me, it seems there are also situations very well motivated physically, which are somehow between the dis uh, extremes which you describe, because there is this Shannon theorem that uh, signals can be continuous, <coughs> but signals with a finite band, which you can represent by a uh, sequence of integer numbers. Arjen Kempf is here, I don't know whether he's present, he's the expert on that. And there's a good reason why signals physically should have finite bandwidths. This is, for example, some ultraviolet cut off somewhere, somewhere introduced by gravity. So maybe physics tells us where we are and not the both extreme worlds. I mean. So I think I will agree with that. Indeed, in the, in the example of intuitionistic numbers I gave, I maybe showed you only that, let's say, the, the computable numbers, which are on one extreme, and let's say this mortal number, which is maybe at the other extreme. But you can easily invent any kind of combinations. For instance, you could imagine, let's say, the digit of pi, but every 10 digits is a random, is a random one. Mm -hmm. So you, know, it's, you can predict almost all digits except 10% of them. Yeah, thank you. Before we go on, let's thank uh, Nicola again.